Glad to have you back. Good morning once again and uh, welcome to The Breakfast. Uh, we now will be talking about what happened today in history many, many years ago. And I am starting with something that happened in the year 2005. It's popularly known as the BTK Killer. And uh, BTK, of course, um, eventually was found out to mean blind, torture and kill. <laughs> this happened um, in uh, Kansas, in uh, Wichita, in Kansas. Um, on this day, January 25th, the BTK killer sent a postcard to a television station. The communication was in a long line sent by the, um, or was one of them rather, in a long line of uh, information that had been sent by the serial killer who had terrorized the community for over 30 years, brutally murdering 10 people and taunting law enforcement, you know, and uh, of course the local media. He eventually was arrested. He, his name, uh, uh, Dennis Lynn Radler. He was arrested a month later on the 25th of February. He was a husband, a father of two, and uh, a compliance officer for the Park City in Kansas. He was then taken into uh, police custody and confessed to being the BTK killer. But the, the crazy part of this is how long it lasted. Um, they started in 1974 when he strangled four members of one family. Uh, six more victims, all female, followed. And, of course, the last one happened in 1991. Throughout the 1970s, the BTK killer, um, or strangler, was, um, of course, continued to send letters to the media in which he claimed knowledge of the crimes. And, of course, in that era, there probably wasn't as much high-tech um, uh, forensic investigation as there is today. And so it wasn't so easy finding out. He used to send items uh, from the victims and, um, you know, small notes basically to the local media to brag and claim that he knew the person who was responsible for the killings, but they, they didn't know who he was. And then in 2004, the attention-seeking BTK killer contacted the media again, sending notes and poems and packages that included some of the victim's jewelry and driver's licenses. Um, he also sent a floppy disk containing a BTK letter to a local television station, which was eventually traced to his uh, church computer, and he was identified. He was uh, later charged with 10 counts of murder, pled not guilty, and then switched his plea to guilty. Eventually, of course, he was sentenced, uh, or rather, unfortunately, he was ineligible for the death penalty because it was not, um, it didn't exist in Kansas City at that time. And um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's really it. Um, a 30-year period, you know, a 30-year span of, um, you know, of killings and strangling of people in the community, that eventually was found out on this day. Or rather, you know, one of the letters was sent on this day. He was eventually caught a month later on the 25th of mm. February. Wow. So I read this research and it said that there are about 3,000 to 4,000 active serial killers yes. in the United States. Yeah, you can imagine those How in terrifying. Nigeria. terrifying. <laughs> right. and, and, you, and you know why? Because people would always say that with, with the way our policing and our criminal justice system works, you know, and our level of investigation and forensic, well, there's barely any forensic, even if they claim to have done one in the Lekki Gates a few weeks ago, <laughs> months after the incident. But, you know, with, you know, the level that we have, you know, a person can be a successful serial killer in Nigeria for years. Uh, right. And we'll you know, go scot-free. Yes. No apprehension. No no one will apprehend the person, no justice, no investigation, no questions asked. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, when they You might be caught, you know, and when they catch you, it will be that your cop is full. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be that all the police, you know, had been investigating and had been tracking this serial killer for a long time and then so eventually was caught. These oh. things usually end up in jungle justice. And <laughs> that's, just, that's just sad. All right. Okay, 1905, January 25th. What happened today was that the largest diamond was found. It was found at the Premier Mine in Pretoria, South Africa. It was a 3,106 carat diamond. Oof. It was discovered during a routine inspection by the mine superintendent. It weighed 1.33 pounds and was christened the Kulian. It was the largest diamond ever found and was named after, you know, Kulian, the, the man who obviously owned the mine. Now, his name was Frederick Wells, and it was uh, at the, the wells where the mine was found was 18 feet behind, below the Earth's surface when he spotted a flash of starlight embedded in the wall, wall just above him, and his discovery was presented that same afternoon to uh, Sir Thomas Collian, who owned the mine. It was the largest gem-quality rough diamond that was ever found. It was then sold to the Transvaal Provincial government, which then presented the stone uh, to Britain's King Edward 
the uh, seventh as a birthday gift. Oh. Now, this diamond was cut into nine large stones, about a hundred smaller ones, and was valued at uh, millions of dollars. Well, this, the story about this is so interesting because it became the largest clay cut diamond in the world. It is now mounted uh, in the head of the sovereign scepter uh, with the cross. And uh, if you recall, in August 1907, of course you don't recall, a vote was held in Parliament <laughs> <laughs> on the Kilian's fate and a motion authorizing a purchase was carried by 42 votes in favor to 19 in the world. Well, I, I mean, South Africa is the sixth largest diamond producer in the world. That's according to stats for 2019. Uh, you know, the diamond production in that country uh, is estimated at 7.2 million carats. Wow, such yes, value. That's a lot, you know, and, um, but, you know, same thing with, um, um, I'm not sure what country is that that produces all the cocoa or... Um, some, I, I, I don't want to make any mistakes now, but, you know, it's about the same story with, you know, Africa producing all these great mineral resources and not, you know, you can't see it anywhere. You can see that, you know, South Africa has, you know, has been, yes, it's not, you know, a, a terribly developed a, a, a third world country in that light, but um, you would not get to see some of these African countries that have... Uh, for decades and for centuries, provided the world with you know some of the most valuable mineral resources, you can't see you know evidence of any of that in their countries. Even though we have these there. things, yeah. it's just you know, and you know, just look at your backyard in the Niger Delta. That you don't even need to go far, you know, to see evidence of stuff like that. You know, where exactly the mineral and the wealth is gotten from eventually turns into the worst hit place and you know the most abandoned area. And so, yes, it includes South Africa, maybe not as bad as other African countries, but you know, definitely would be named as one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I saw um, there was a documentary that was very popular in, in, on social media, you know, a couple of months ago of uh, little kids that were used in the mining industry. Um, and of course, they were earning peanuts daily. Uh, their families could barely even feed. But most of all these, you know, minerals and most of all these, you know, um, resources are sent outside Africa to other countries that don't produce that become, anything. Yeah, exactly, and become enriched on the back yes. of that label, yes. Anyway, that's it uh, for the Today in History. As I said, 1905, January 25th, the world's largest diamond was found in a mine in South Africa. Random question, if you found that diamond, what would you do? If I found it? Yeah. If you're walking I think around, the, I think the keyword is I, so that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have for you. 2005 and what? 1905. 1905. Today in history, two very, very major events. One of them not a very good story, but actually both of them not very happy stories. But of course, uh, the diamond story might be a little brighter. Um, and that's what we have for you. Moving up next, we're going to be having a conversation about the issues in the southwestern part of Nigeria. Uh, this morning, it is said that the Mieti Ala would be meeting with southwest governors and they would be having a conversation on the way forward to create a peaceful environment and a you know, better living you know, environment for uh, people of the southwest. What will that mean? meeting bring forward we do not know but of course we'll follow it but we're having a conversation about that coming up next after this break